I just want to thank you all for being here. We want to welcome everybody who's a part of our worship experience this morning. Whether you're listening to us uh, on podcast, you're watching us by video, or you're in the room, let's give everybody a big hand for being a part of our worship experience today. So glad you're here. And uh, let's take our text, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. We're reading out of the New International Version this morning. And everyone read it with me. Read. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Father, I just thank you for your word today. I thank you for your presence, that you're here. I thank you that that you have people here that are open hearts and ready to learn and ready to take in your word. And thank you for using our life. Make us what you want us to be. Help us to not just be a, a Christian for you and for us, but help us to realize that our Christianity is to extend beyond ourselves into the lives of other people by sharing your love and your grace and your faith and your gospel with them. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said. Amen. You can be seated after you give three people a high five. Oh, gotcha. So glad you're here this morning. You know, I think that it's very important for us to understand that faith is about working things out. Sometimes we think faith is merely just believing in something, but I think faith Real faith comes with corresponding action. The Bible says that faith without works is dead. Now, let's not get confused. It's not saying that we do works of the law in order to be saved. Uh, It's that when we are saved and we come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ, we give our life to him, that good works should come out of us. In other words, what I believe, I act on. And so whatever my faith is, I act on that faith. I have a corresponding action that goes with what I believe. (coughs) Excuse me. So I think what happens in a lot of our lives, though, is when we face trials and we face problems and we face issues, we, we can't get a handle on where this is coming from or why we're having to deal with it. And sometimes we operate and function almost like, we're spoiled children. Don't get me wrong. I'm not calling you spoiled, but sometimes that's how we act. It's like, I should never have to go through anything hard. And why am I having to deal with this? And this is too difficult. And just let me say to you that if you've become a Christian on the premise that you're never going to have a hard time again, uh, somebody has lied to you. Um, That is not true. It doesn't mean that you're never going to have anything hard again, but it means that now you have a Savior who can walk you through and help you. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to, you know, the Bible tells us in Isaiah that you can walk through the water, the flood water, and not drown, or you can walk through the fire and not be burned. So it's not that we're not going to deal with the flood waters or we're not going to deal with the fires of life, but it's that God will go with us through. Sometimes God delivers us out. Sometimes God walks us through, but either way, hand in hand with God, we're going to make it. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, we're going to make it. Come on, turn to your other neighbor and say, you're going to make it. So whatever you're dealing with today, whatever you're struggling with, whatever issues you have, you're going to make it. And we just need to get used to this idea of working things out. Everybody say, work it out. I love my my wife's teaching methods. She has some great teaching methods. And one of the things that she does in, she's in first grade now. She taught third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. When did you teach what you've taught all, what, three, one, you, she oversaw a Christian school. She's just awesome. Everybody just give her a big hand. I was awesome. She, she's like, she's like, Gabriel, you don't know what you're talking about. But anyway, She has some great methods, and one of the methods she has is like when her kids are working together and they're trying to figure out problems, and they like she'll get a kid to go up to the board and they'll be working on the problem, and then when they get it worked out, the whole class goes whatever the name. Let's just say their name is David. The whole class goes way to work it out, David. Way to work it out. So the whole class is like partying. Way to work it out, David. Way to work. I have her do this with me at home. Uh, it's very encouraging. Like when I'm having struggles and I finally get something, I just have her come in the room. She's like, way to work it out, baby. Way to work it out. It's very good for me. But you know, that's so good when we encourage one another, when we lift each other, when we encourage one another not to give up, not to fail, not to let it go, not to just 
run away, but when we deal with it and we have people in our life will say, hey, come on, I'll deal this with you. I'll deal with this with you. I'll help you out. Way to work it out. We need to learn to work it out. We need to learn to work it out. So many aspects of our life would be so easy for us to just give up. I mean, I've gone through things. I don't know if you've gone through things. I've gone through things in life where I just wanted to quit. I mean, how many of you ever just wanted to quit? I mean, come on, you're not human if you haven't faced something at some point at some time in your life that you just wanted to go, I quit. You know, that's why Janae and I, years ago, we learned in our relationship, and I'm just so sorry for you today that if you've had some broken relationships or some broken things in your relationship, I just want to say God's grace is on you, and he will bless you and bring things about in your life and restore what's been stolen from you. But I just want to say we, in our, the beginning of our relationship, we just decided there are certain terms there are certain things, there are certain attitudes we are not going to have in our relationship. Quitting is one of those. Divorce, we don't let that word come in or our, you know, because every one of us have been in situations with our relationships uh, that, you know, there have been times where you're like, I quit. H- how many have ever quit? You know, every pastor I know quits every Monday. <laughs> not every pastor I know, but 99.9%. They, 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 they want things to work out a certain way. They want things to happen. They get, they, they get on this emotional high of Sunday. And then they, on Monday, they question, am I even making a difference? Is anything even happening? What's going on? I just want to give up. Somebody says something to them that they shouldn't say or somebody mentions something or they hear through the grapevine that somebody said something that somebody said. And they just go home and they're just like, well, I just quit. And, you know, I just a long time ago, I just decided I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. I don't care. You know, people are people. And in any, any, any place in life, you know, you, you, you could want to quit because people are people. C- c- come on, somebody. How many of you ever had somebody quit you? That hurts, doesn't it? I've had friends in my life that just quit me. How many of you have ever had a friend that they said, they got in the friendship with you, and they said it was a, you know, I just want to be mutual, mutually edifying to one another and just want to be connected, and I have no agenda here. I just want to be close. And then, and then when things don't go the way they saw it going or they didn't get what they wanted out of the relationship or they weren't able to manipulate you to do this or that, all of a sudden now they disappear and they quit on you. How many of you have ever been quit on? I see kids doing this all the time, uh, the bestie thing. This is my bestie, and then next week their bestie is somebody else. How many of you notice that? I got a bestie. I got three besties. Well, somebody's not bestie. You know what I'm saying? If you got three, somebody's not bestie. There can only be one bestie. That's the whole point of the word best. I don't know if y'all know that. But in relationships, in marriage, in finances, in career paths, in all issues of our life, spiritually even, in church life, we get to the place where we just, we're just willing to give up. And, and, and here's what I, I want to say to you. I, I realize that there are some things that are abusive and some things that are bad and some things that need to be left and need to be quit. But let me just be honest with you. Most of our culture, we're quitting, we're leaving, we're giving up before it's time. Now, uh, I love this, this story of Jack Canfield. I don't know if you know who Jack Canfield is, but Jack Canfield is, is a, a great leadership guru, and he, he's, written, he's, written, he's written and also written some good books. And uh, he, he's the co-originator or co-writer of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books. How many of you, how many of you have read Chicken Soup for the Soul? Uh, and, and now, you know, I remember, I, I'm old enough to remember when the first Chicken Soup for the Soul came out, like the original one. And I just remember loving that book because it's, it's great for a communicator. Because if you need stories, I mean, these are some great stories. People who've overcome, you need encouragement. And so then th- they had that one Chicken Soup for the Soul. Now there's a Chicken Soup for the Soul for every single kind of thing out there, like chicken soup for the soul for coaches, chicken soup for the soul for pastors, chicken soup for the soul for mamas, chicken soup for the soul for papas. I mean, it's just 250 different chicken soup for the soul books. But what you may not know is when the two people who originated the chicken soup for the soul idea took it to be published, they were told 130 
times no one wants to read a book about some encouraging stories. No one. A hundred and thirty times they were told no. Can't do it. At a hundred, their agent dropped them. Like, no one wants this, guys. I can't make any money on you. I'm dumping you as a client. Now, how many of you have ever felt rejected before? It's one thing to be rejected by the outside, but when people on the inside start rejecting you, that's a whole nother level of rejection. But these guys just kept on and kept on and kept on. And, you know, because they kept on and didn't receive the rejection, a small publisher picked them up after 130 rejections, and now there are over 250 of these different books. And I want to say, five. this is the, the statistic, 500 million copies have been sold worldwide. That is working it out. You see, when we see problems and issues and things in our life, we, we have a tendency to do one of two things. Well, some people are bent to, to fight. You know, we have that fight or flight type mentality. And some people are bent to fight. And they'll fight. They'll go for it. And they'll just pound and pound and pound until they find some kind of success. And then other people just run from it. They'll just say, ah, oh, I don't want to do it. You've told me no. I don't like that feeling. How many, how many don't like the feeling of rejection? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you do not like to be rejected. How many, it's, since some people are not participating, how many just love rejection? It's their favorite thing. Raise your hand. Okay, how many are not going to raise your hand no matter what I say? Raise your hand. I knew somebody would raise their hand. So here's the deal. <coughs> Listen very closely. No one likes how rejection feels. You know what you should do? One time I was in, one time I was in uh, we were planting a church, and, and, and I had lost a job uh, that they just eliminated my position. So I was working a full-time secular job, and then I was planting a church. And so I would lost that job. They did away with my position. I was laid off. And so I had to go find something to do quick. And the only thing I could find, come on, listen, listen. The only thing I could find was a telemarketing company in Oklahoma City. And let me, let me just tell you something. If you don't like rejection, you should do this for a little while. Just to get yourself calloused. Just to get a callous built up. I've been rejected in every language. I've been rejected in it with every kind of emotional response. I've been rejected with curse words and without curse words. I've been rejected just by the phone being hung up as soon as my voice was heard. I've been rejected by somebody leading you on to make you think you made a sale and then think, I'm not interested. Come on, somebody. Somebody said, my pastor was a telemarketer. I don't think I can go to church here anymore. It's a horrible job. And, 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 and on the other side, I hate receiving calls from telemarketers. How are telemarketers getting on our cell phones now? I'm like, somebody please make this stop. And everybody says, well, no one likes it. No one, but somebody's got to be liking it, y'all, because they're staying in business and growing. So everybody who's buying stuff from telemarketers, stop it. I just remember feeling so, I would go home every night feeling totally rejected. Uh, you know, it was hard to get a job because no one wants to hire somebody who's planning a church. They know you're not going to be there long. They know you're not going to be highly committed. So that was really the only thing I could find. And listen, there's nothing wrong with it. You do what you need to do to provide for your family. You know what I'm saying? But the bottom line is I just was rejected after it went. I would go home feeling like, man, oh, and I'd have to drive up to Oklahoma City to go to that job. And I would just be driving going, oh, I can't stand this. And I got to find something else. The whole time I'm taking those phone calls or making those phone calls. I'm sitting here looking for jobs to find. It was just, it was horrible. And I had this friend on this job that just didn't care at all. He was always happy-go-lucky. And you know what I found out? He was happy-go-lucky. He was rarely rejected. But the reason he was rarely rejected is because he had gotten so good at connecting with people on that phone because he was willing to take the rejections. He had learned from each rejection how people respond. He had learned how hard this person didn't like that, that person didn't like this. And he'd gotten so good at this that, man, he was killing it. He was taking home bank. And let me just tell you something. Rejection don't hurt so bad when you're making good money at it. He worked it out. Way to work it out, John. Way to work it out. We need to learn that when hard things happen, 
that we don't just give up. We don't just throw our hands in the air. Especially believers, we have no reason to. I love what Ross Perot said. He said, uh, most people give up just when they're about to achieve success. They quit on the one-yard line. They give up at the last minute of the game one foot from a winning touchdown. I've seen this happen in people's lives so often. I've had it happen in my own life that you just, I wonder if we could put on some cosmic glasses today, if we could see things from God's perspective when we're right at the edge. We're right at the edge of winning. And, 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 and a lot of times when you're right on the cusp of winning and overcoming and gaining victory in your life, that's when the pressure is the most intense. And you just feel so overwhelmed by it. You just feel like it's never going to happen and nothing ever going to give way and we're never going to reach the goal. And you're fighting and you're pressing. And I wonder how often we just throw our hands in the air and say, this isn't going to work, and I don't, I'm never going to accomplish this. And we walk away from it, and we have no idea how close we were to the win. You know, I love football. I love the Dallas Cowboys anyway. Uh, I saw a friend of mine who's like, he's a more rabid Dallas Cowboy fan than I am, and he just tweeted this the other day, I hate being a Dallas Cowboy fan. <laughs> I just hate it because every year, here's what we say, this is going to be our year to lose. That's how it feels when you're a Dallas Cowboy fan. Some of y'all are offended by this. Uh, I, I'm telling you, sometimes that's the way it is. And I've seen, I've seen football teams get down in that spot where they're, they're, they're they're in that moment of pressing it in. They need a first down or they need a touchdown, and they're right on the goal line. They're in the red zone, maybe even two to three yards. But have you ever noticed what happens when an offense is two to three yards out from the end zone? What happens? There's a goal line defense. In other words, the defense changes. And I just got news for you. Sometimes... Sometimes when you're going through struggles and when you're going through fights and it's a spiritual attack on your life, you need to understand that the devil has changed his strategy. He has intensified his strategy simply because he knows you're close to the win. He knows you're close to the end zone. And instead of giving up, instead of throwing your hands up, get down on that ball, hike that ball, and with everything you have, run through that line and get into that end zone and show the devil and his crazy defense that he cannot stop. Stop what God wants to advance in your life. Come on, somebody. We don't give up. We don't quit. We don't forget. We don't throw our hands in the air. We don't run away. We fight through. We work it out. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, way to work it out. I love this. I love the, I love, I love the story of Moses. Moses is just an incredible leader. I mean, an incredible leader. Ridiculous leading three million people through the wilderness to the promise. Three million people, and, and not just three million people. Three million very complainy, disgruntled, opinionated people. My Lord, if they had had social media back then, he'd have never made it. Come on, somebody. He'd have been like, smoke them, God. You know what I'm saying? Let's be done with this. Come on. People tweeting in the far reaches, in the, la the farthest tent from Moses. Well, if Moses would just get it right, we'd have water to drink. We should just go back to Egyptian slavery. Because Moses has led us out here to die. There were times that God and Moses did have a conversation like that. And Moses said, God, your people. These are your people. Kill them. They're not gonna, they don't love you. They don't care. People can be so, uh, you know, uh, I don't know uh, how to say it. We can all be so wishy-washy, can't we? One minute we're fired up, next minute we're complaining. Like, I was on the sidelines, the Eagles game, Friday night, and <laughs> it was so funny. Played an unbelievable game. Played the ninth, I'm not going to go into too much of it, but I, I enjoyed it, so I'm going to tell you a little bit. Played the ninth ranked team in the, in the state, 
and came out and just throttled them in the first half. Just throttled. We, nobody expected. Even the boys on the team did not expect that. I mean, they came to fight. They came to play. There was no doubt they showed up. But, boy, it was like, wow, we're doing this. And amazing. And, and we had a little bit of a fall off in the second half. But they just kept pounding and kept. And the other team came out with a new strategy. And they were working really hard. And so it went back and forth a little bit. And I just heard somebody say, well, I tell you what, if this or that would have been better. And if they had done this and that, we wouldn't be in this spot. In this spot, we still won by 18 points. But from first half, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like one little turn, like we we struggled a little bit. We had a little bit of a difficulty. And someone said, well, they need to change this and they need to change it. How many of you know that everybody who's looking from the outside has an opinion about what's going on in the inside? And they think they can tell you what you need to know, but they've never done what you're trying to do. They've never been a part of it. They don't even know what's going on. And they have all the opinions in the world. Come on, you know how I know this? Because Mike Stoop got fired. Some of y'all don't even know who Mike Stoop is. He's a defensive coordinator for OU. He got fired. And everybody's cheering. He needed to be fired, I guess, because he was doing a bad job over and over and over again, year after year after year. But I just thought to myself, how many people have been in his spot? They don't know anything about it. We know, I know so much about NBA. Every year when I watch the Thunder, I, if, they would just, if they would just put a line into my house, I could tell them exactly how to win. Come on, somebody. How many of you guys feel like that right now? Like I said in my recliner, if every team would just call me, they would win. Come on, somebody. See, y'all don't raise your hand, but I hear you talk, and I know it's true. My fantasy football team doing bad if, if they just played better. Duh. Maybe you didn't do good picking the right people. It's never your fault, is it? Gentlemen. (laughs) I'm joking. We got to work it out, guys. We can't let the opinions of people outside of what we're doing affect how we make decisions. We can't. Moses, if he would have listened to people, he would have never made it. If he would have listened to the negative opinions of people or the well-meant advice that knew nothing about the situation, if he had listened to the complaining, if he had listened to the griping, they never would have made it across the Red Sea. But I think it's so interesting that the most interesting part of that whole journey from slavery into the promised land across the Red Sea, the most interesting part of that journey to me is right at the the Red Sea. And here's why it's interesting. Because in, 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 in Exodus chapter 14, it starts by saying this, that God took the children of Israel right up to the Red Sea and told them to camp. Well, why? If he knew he was going to split the Red Sea and walk them over on the other side on dry ground, why didn't he just, when they got up to the sea, just open that sea up and let them walk on dry ground? Why? Why didn't he do that? He could have done that. He obviously can split the Red Sea. He obviously can make the, dry, the ground dry. He obviously could have gotten them over. But no, he told them, get up to the water and camp. And so they did what he said. And then, and then he tells his purpose. Now, see, here's what we never understand. Now, I'm just going to tell you something. Negative things happen to us in our life. They don't always happen. God doesn't always bring them to you. But th- here's the truth. Here's a th- theological truth that you can know. God's not about making you sick. God's not about messing your life up to, to, so he can show you he's powerful or teaching you a lesson by putting sickness on you or whatever the case may be. God is not about that. But God will do one of two things. Either when you deal with something, whether it's negative or positive, you deal with something in your life, it will, it's either brought to you by God or God will use it for his benefit and his glory in your life. And that's the facts. And sometimes we wonder, why am I going through this hardship? Why am I going through this difficulty? We might want to stop and ask ourselves, what is God trying to teach me? What does God want me to learn? What does God want me to take out of this so that when I go through something later, I'll be strong enough or I'll have knowledge? Or maybe I won't go through this again because I've changed my thinking or I've changed the way I act or I've changed my attitude about something. What is God trying to show me? And we have to realize that God told them, come up here and camp. Think about that. God knew that the Philistines, or not the Philistines, but the Egyptians were coming. He even hardened Pharaoh's heart to say, I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen here. These guys, they've escaped from us. We can't let our workforce escape. Let's go get them. 
So after he promised them he would let them go, he decides to go get them. So God doesn't part the Red Sea till the Egyptians are running up behind them, till they can literally see their enemy coming. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you felt like, why does it have to be this way? Why am I having to go through this? Why I'm sitting here looking at a problem that's going to overwhelm me. It's going to overtake me. I was watching this, I was watching this guy on Facebook the other day. I don't know if you saw him, but he, he, was, saying, he was saying something. He was on a video. He's like a, a, an older African man, and these people were running. And I don't know why he stopped running. They were running in like a 5K. And I don't know why he stopped running, but he, he just stopped running, and he was just standing there encouraging everybody to, to go along. So he's encouraging people, and, and he was saying, come on, you can do it. Oh, that's good. You, you did good. Oh, you're running well. Keep running. And he was just, and it was funny just the way he was doing it. And then all of a sudden, there was a guy, he was an older man man and he was kind of just barely moving along like this and there was a a younger man coming behind him and going to take him over and he said he's going to overtake you he's going to overtake you don't let him overtake you don't let him screaming at the guy don't let him over that guy was old he's I'm just you know you could tell look on his face like man I'm just trying to get to the finish line I don't care if a young guy overtakes me but then there was somebody else coming he was like overtake them (laughs) overtake them and sometimes in life that's how we feel we feel like we're going to be overtaken But let me just tell you, it's the people that overtake are the people who've been overtaken. When we've been overtaken at times in our life, we know how it feels. When we've gone through hardships and difficulties at times, we know how it feels to go through difficult situations and hard situations. And we know how to have faith and we know how to be strong. And that's what God was teaching the children of Israel as they stood there on the banks of the Red Sea and the Egyptians were coming up behind them full on going to destroy them. Here's what God said to Moses. Scripture, Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. Moses said this to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again never forever. Now listen, listen. Sometimes when we go through hard difficulties, don't give up, work it out. Sometimes when you're faced with struggles, because God God may not be showing up exactly when you think he should. Like, I need you now, God. But God knows when now really is. And what God is trying to show you, and the reason he's allowing that to happen in your life is because he's about to show you what he's really made of. He's about to show you what he can really do. Now, can you imagine how dramatic this moment have, must have been? Because then he says to Moses, hold your staff up. And Moses tells the people, be quiet. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I feel like I need to say this for somebody today. I feel like this is almost prophetic for somebody today. You need to stand still and be quiet. You're complaining, you're griping, you're moaning. You can't even see God in your life. You can't see God and what he's doing behind the scenes because you're so ate up with your problem. And you need to stop looking at your problem and start looking at your God. You need to get your eyes focused on God and stand still because the reason you're walking through it now is because God's about to show up and show you what he can do in your life. Stop acting like he doesn't exist. Stop leaning on your own self and your own strength and your own uh, abilities. Start trusting in him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. Hard moments can be the holiest of moments. See, before Moses came to this place in his life, hear me, before Moses came to this place in his life, he had gone through some seasons. How many of you know that there are seasons in life? Now, here's the thing. If you're older and you're getting older, you understand this concept. When you're younger, it's hard to understand this concept because you haven't gone through many seasons. But we all understand seasons of nature, right? We're we're in a transition right now. Coming out of summer, going into fall, about to turn into winter, and then it'll be spring again someday. 
And we can't wait for that day when spring comes and things are blooming again and, and it's all nice and headed towards summer. All these seasons have an effect on us. Seasons represent different things. When you talk about winter season in someone's life, it, it usually means the end of life, the time when, when all the fruit has been born and now it's, everything is dying and everything is moving towards the end. And, 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 and when you think about the spring, you're thinking about birth and fruit coming out everywhere and newness of life and freshness of life and color and vibrance and all of these things. We have seasons that we go through in life. Moses had three very distinct seasons in his life. You know who Moses was? Moses was saved by his family because God, they knew he was a special child and he was raised in the palace of, of Pharaoh. He was raised to be Pharaoh's kid. He was raised to be next in line to serve Pharaoh. Then he, he did something stupid. He got ahead of God because he had deliverance on the inside of him. He tried to deliver somebody before it was really the time to deliver the children of Israel. He got ahead of God and he killed somebody trying to deliver them from the oppression of their enemy. Listen, when we get in our own flesh and we start trying to bring deliverance from oppressive forces and we're not doing and following the timing and the will of God, what happens is things break down. You get frustrated. You go off the rails. And that's exactly what happened with Moses. People found found out that he had done this and he ran. He ran for his life. He ran to the backside of the desert. So he had spent 40 years in the palace of Pharaoh. Now he was 40 years in the wilderness by himself as a shepherd. It was a lonely time for Moses. It was a hard time. It was a difficult time. Can you imagine coming out of opulence? I mean, literally having anything you want going to the backside of the desert. I mean, I can't even imagine how difficult that must have been for him. But it was, not just, it was not just a time of not having all the wealth and all the opulence. Now, it was even more difficult than that for him because he felt alone. He wasn't anybody. He wasn't, he wasn't necessarily going to now be able to identify with the Jews that he had, become, uh, he had had a realization that he would identify with his family, his origination, his race. And, 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 and he's not an Egyptian. He's not a Jew. He's not anybody really. And he's on the backside of the desert leading sheep. Not the most uh, uh, awesome job in the world. And so here he is. He even named his kids, I'm alone. That was the name. That was their names. If you translate their names, it's like, I'm a, I'm a lonely man in a lonely land. I mean, how would you like that to be your name as a kid? Hey, come here, lonely. I mean, that's not fun. But that's the experience he was having in his life. Have you ever been in that season? You come out of a season where everything seems to be going well, everything seems to be going fine, and you go into a season where nothing is going fine and nothing is working right, and this is not how I thought things would turn out. Many of us, when we get in our 40s and 50s, this is where we go. This is what we think. It's what they call a midlife crisis. I'm dealing with not having achieved what I thought I would achieve at this point, which all of those standards are so relative and ignorant, really. And Moses was in that place. I was a king, now I'm nothing. I had a people, now I have no people. So he's got a wife, he's bearing kids, she's bearing kids for him, and his life is just, he had almost settled, this is how it's going to be. And at the end of that season of his life, God showed up. But when God showed up, it was one of the most difficult times of his life. Listen to me. It was one of the most hardest times of his life. Can I just share with you that this is the truth and it is a principle that you can follow all throughout the word of God that some of the holiest moments of your life, some of the most connected moments with God in your life, some of the most spiritually empowering, uh, enabling times of your life will come out of the hardest moments of your life. No one wants it to be that way, but it is the way that it is. And there's something about getting into those moments that causes us to turn our attention on God and say, God, I need you. I cannot make it on my own. I need your help. Moses was in the, one of those situations. He thought his life of leadership was over, but God God showed up. You know the burning bush. He went up to the burning bush. God spoke to him out of the burning bush. He said, take off your shoes. Where you're standing is holy ground. Where he was standing was hard. Where he was standing was difficult ground. Where he was standing was lonely ground. Where he was standing was not justified. And it couldn't be rationalized. And why is this happening to me? That's where he was standing. I don't even have a people. I can't identify with anybody. 
I don't belong anywhere. What, what has come of my life, God? This is the season I'm in. This is not holy ground. This is hard ground. But God shows up in the most difficult of our moments, the times where we just don't even think we can take another step, the times where we feel like it's over, the times where we can't do it anymore. we just thrown our hands up and said, I don't know what else to do. God will show up and burn out of that bush and say to you, look, I've got a plan for you. See, because here's the thing we don't understand about seasons. Every season in the hands of God is an opportunity for God to craft and equip and develop you for the next season of your life. And when we find ourselves walking around the same issues, around the same problems, going through the same problems every time, every season of life, it's because we didn't learn the lessons of the season. We didn't allow God to equip us. We spent too much time complaining about the season. We spent too much time being irritated with the season. We spent too much time about being depressed with the season. But what you don't realize is when Moses was on the backside of that desert, no longer in the palace, and he was leading around sheep, what better preparation could there have been? for what he was about to do. Living in the hardships of that desert, living in the difficulties of that wilderness, and leading sheep who God always equates with people. God said, I want you to do something. I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And this season had done to Moses what it does to a lot of us kills our esteem. When you go through a hard season, sometimes you lose confidence. How many of you have ever lost confidence? You had a dream, but then you went through a hard season, and now you're not so sure anymore. But can I tell you something? Listen, don't lose confidence because your confidence shouldn't be in you anyway. Your confidence should be in God. Moses looked at that burning bush. God said, do this. He said, no, nah, I'll get somebody else to do it. I can't talk. I'm not clear of speech. I'll get your brother to help you. See, when God has a purpose for you, he's not taking any excuses. So you might as well just drop it and say, all right, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And then God leads him into the greatest victory ever. And so now, speed up. He's gone through this one season who trained him for the next season, which trained him for the next season of his life. Now he is totally equipped and thoroughly confident in his ability to go stand before Pharaoh, who he had left because he was a criminal, and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. And when he did finally let his people go through a big show of the hand of God, putting all those plagues on Egypt, and then they get free. Now they get free. How many of you have ever just thought, whoa, I won a victory. I got through it. It was awesome. Man, and run smack dab into another wall of obstacle and irritation. Ever been, anybody ever been there? Like, don't be that person, though. I hear people say when things are going good in their life, they're like, I just, let's just keep it like this because I'm waiting for the other shoe to fall. I don't, I don't know what's about to happen. Everything's been good for about 30 days. I, I don't, that, that, Jesus, please just let it stay just like it is because I don't, I don't want to know what's coming. Don't be that. That's not operating in faith. That's operating in fate. We don't operate in fate. We operate in faith. Our confidence is not in our circumstances. Our confidence is in our God. And so that's what he did. So he gets them right there to the Red Sea. Can you imagine the dra drama of this moment? He gets them right there to the Red Sea. And, and then he tells them to camp out long enough for the Egyptians to catch up. And then watch this. They're getting so close that it's scary. And he says to Moses, get up and hold up your staff. The Spirit of God, now watch this. No matter how hard it gets, God's always there. You may not feel like he is, but he always is. The Spirit of God, which followed them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, moved to behind them and stood between them and their enemy. So no matter what, God was going to protect them. And then he said, get up. Moses was saying, God, now what are we going to do? And God said, what are you asking me for? Hold your staff up. That's literally, go back and read it. That's what God says. You know what to do. So he holds his staff up, and the water starts parting. Can you imagine this? Th th three million people going across dry ground in the middle of the Red Sea. Can you imagine this? 
with your mind? Can you imagine the drama? And here come the Egyptians. They're, they're barreling down on them. They're coming as hard as they can. They want their slaves back. They don't want to lose this. And they come right down on them. And, 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 and God just holds them at bay until all of the uh, Israelites get on the other side. And then once they get on the other side, he closes the waters after he's let the Egyptians get in. The Egyptians come running. I don't know why they thought that would be okay. I, I, guess, I guess they didn't understand the way God worked. But he's like, you're not going to attack my people. Your oppression on my people are, is done. It's over. Listen, I love that when you get in that moment where you've extended your faith and God says to the enemy, that's it. No more. You have crossed the line too many times. You don't get to have their kids. You don't get to have their family. You don't get to have their possessions. Move off my kid. Sometimes the hardest places in our lives are the holiest. There are times to learn and develop and grow into the man or woman of faith that God needs us to be so that he can advance his kingdom through our life. These seasons are hard sometimes and they're difficult because we miss the point. Can I just say, be attentive. Don't have such a busy life. Don't have such a life that is just about everything else but God that you miss the point, that you miss what God's trying to say, that you miss what God's trying to do when you're going through the difficult time. Jesus never said things wouldn't be difficult. He, matter of fact, he said the exact opposite in John ch ch chapter, uh, I can't remember, but it, there's, a t there's a scripture in the, hey, your pastor's not perfect. The, there's a scripture that says, in this world, I think, 1633 of John, something like that. In this world, you shall have tribulation. He says, you shall have tribulation. There are going to be times that it's hard. But, everybody say but. Be of good cheer. Be happy. Be full of joy. Be excited. Let God's spirit arise within you. Why? Be of good cheer. Because I have overcome the world. Listen, there's nothing you're going to face that God can't handle. There's nothing you're going to face that Jesus hasn't already taken care of by going to that cross. There's nothing you're going to face that if you'll extend your faith to the power of God and let his Holy Spirit rule in your life, you will not be defeated. You will not be overcome. It may be hard. It may be difficult. But rejoice in the Lord because God God is going to come through. He can't help but do it. God set Moses apart for that holy life, being set apart so that God could use him as a child. And even when Moses got ahead of God, he set himself apart from the other children of Israel, but God used that circumstance to train him and to develop him. And then God used Moses to set the children of Israel apart from slavery. All of these moments went through hard seasons, but all turned out to be holy ground. So the question is, what do we do in hard moments? Galatians chapter 6, verse 19, I'll say it again. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Turn your neighbor right now and say, don't give up. Come on, you can be more enthusiastic than that. We're almost done. Say, don't give up. Come on, if you're going through something hard, don't give up. If you're going through difficulty, don't give up. If you're going through hardness in your marriage, don't give up. If you're dealing with struggles in your finances, don't give up. If you're having emotional problems, don't give up. If you're, just, you're dealing with anxiety and stress and pressure, don't give up. Come on, don't quit. Turn your neighbor and say, work it out. Come on. He said, don't become weary. This word weary here means literally to be utterly spiritless, to have nothing left, to be anxious. Do you know when we get weary like this is when we've stopped depending on God and started depending on ourselves. Don't be weary. He said, the, the word means exhausted. It means spent. It means to be utterly spiritless. No spirit left in you. And he said, don't be weary in doing good. This, this word in the Greek means of uncertain affinity, properly, beautiful, chiefly, figuratively good, literally or morally, valuable or virtuous. It means don't ever, don't ever try to do this on your own. Let God's righteousness be your righteousness. Let him change you from the inside out. Let him do something in your life that causes you to see, see yourself 
through the hard seasons and through the difficulties, through the circumstances. Listen, there's nothing too hard for God. You need to get it in your mind. You need to get it in your spirit. There is a lot of things that are too hard for you, too hard for me, but there's nothing that's too hard for God. Nothing is impossible with God. God said he could do anything, that there's nothing he can't do. All things are possible for those who believe. The Bible said, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God said, if he puts his hand on it and he won't take it away. Can I just tell you something? God is able to see you through in your relationships. He's able to see you through in your finances. He's able to see you through in your mental and emotional stresses. He's able to see you through in the battles that you face, the spiritual ineptitude that you feel. God is able to pick you up from any circumstance, any brokenness, any hardship, any difficulty. There is nothing that our God can't do. I can testify it in my own life that that I've gone through things that I didn't think I'd make it through. I remember when I started as a pastor, 22 years old, got in the middle of a domestic dispute between a husband and wife. I wasn't wise enough or understood how to keep myself out of the middle of that mess. And they used and manipulated me to the point that I almost had a nervous breakdown. I came in to my house, threw myself on the couch, and began to scream at the top of my lungs uncontrollably, not in my own power or my own strength. I just didn't know what else to do. Janae ran into the room and put her hands on me and said, David, what is wrong? What is wrong? I felt like my world was coming apart. It was too much. But I can tell you right now that I called out on God and God never let me down. And he picked me up and he walked me through and he changed my life in a way that I'll never forget. And I'm going to tell you something. When you don't think you have enough power, there is power in the name of Jesus. When you don't think you have enough strength, there is glory in the name of Jesus. When you don't think you can walk another step, or take another move. There's always power in the Holy Spirit to do what he's called you to do. Sorry for getting emotional. But my God is good to me. And I don't know if you've ever been through anything hard enough to make you afraid. But I'm telling you, if you have, and you've called out on God, and he's come through, you know there's nothing like it. But he said in the proper time, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season. Everybody say due season. See, this is where we give up. We give up and we quit and we fail and we walk away and we throw our hands up because we don't think God's season is our season. (coughs) Excuse me. We, We allow ourselves to become impatient and irresolute and fearful and anxious because God won't do it when we want him to do it. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. But let me just tell you something. I want you to hear me. God doesn't have to work on your timetable because he stands outside of time. And I can tell you this, he'll never be late. He'll show up when you need him. Can't always explain why things happen and what happens and what life is all about and why we have to go through the things we go through. We can settle on one thing, though. It's all because of sin. It's all because of the curse on this planet. It's all because of mistakes that we make. But the reality is we don't have to give into that. We don't have to be defeated by it. God is on our side. So don't give up. Wait on God. Be patient. So our attitude in this season of hardship should be tenacity, resolve, faith, faithfulness, perseverance, working it out. Turn to your neighbor and say, work it out. Come on, you don't know what that person walked in here. You don't know what they're dealing with today. You don't know the struggles that they had just getting to this house. You don't know what's going on in their family with with their kids or with their spouse. You don't know what's happening on their job. You might be setting somebody today right now that looks just fine on the outside, but on the inside they're saying, my addiction's got the best of me. Or they might be saying on the inside, my family is falling apart. Or they might be saying, I just don't know if life is worth living anymore. I'm telling you right now, look at me everybody. You don't know what somebody else is going through, but God is always aware. And we need to allow the Holy Spirit to ignite a flame in us that says, I care enough to hold hands with my neighbor, to hold, to go shoulder to shoulder with my brother and sister in Christ and say, we're going to work this out. And when they get it right, we're going to say, way to work it out, David. Way to work it out. And we're going to hold hand in hand and we're going to walk each other through until we get to that place of victory in our life. And then we're going to turn 
learn and operate from victory to victory. And we're going to lead other people into defeating the enemies of their life. Work it out. Looking obstacles as opportunities. Looking at rejection as motivation. Looking at failure as education. The problem is we too often, even in Christian circles, have a defeatist mindset. The fetus mindset said, when it gets too hard, quit. If it doesn't go your way, quit. If it doesn't work, quit. If there's conflict, quit. The reward, though, and this is what God is trying to tell us, if you won't give up, you will reap. Listen to me. I don't know who I'm saying this for today. Look me in the face, everybody. Spiritually, physically, financially, relationally. Look at me. Don't give up. Work it out. Don't give up. We're here for you. Don't give up. Don't quit. You feel like it's over. You feel like you lost. You feel like you can't get up. You feel like you can't move forward. Don't give up. Work it out. Work it out. We're here to work it out with you. Work it out. Don't give up. But you don't understand the pressure, Pastor David. I understand it. But you don't know what I'm going through. You don't, you don't know how I feel. You don't know the shame. You don't know what people think. Not, none of that matters. Listen to me. Don't give up. Don't give up. Work it out. But my kid is just gone. I don't know how to get him back. Don't give up. Work it out. But my family is broke. It's okay. God's going to restore don't give up. Work it out. We are Christians. We are believers. We serve the King of all kings. Jesus didn't win the battle at the cross. He won the battle in the garden. The holy place for Jesus wasn't the devastation of the cross. It wasn't even in the tomb that he resurrected from. It was in the garden where he struggled within himself as to whether or not he would give up. And the Bible says in Hebrews that for the joy that was set before him, despising the shame, he endured the cross. In that garden, the Bible says that his sweat became as great drops of blood, that he was stressed unto death, is what the Bible says. He felt like he was going to die right then and there. He was so anxious. And he went through this battle, and he went through this struggle on the inside of him. Am I going to give up? Am I not? And that struggle for him was the struggle for all mankind because the Bible is very clear that he could have left. He could have said, I'm not doing this, called legions of angels, destroyed everyone, and said, they're not worth it. In that moment at that cross when he didn't give up, it wasn't him he wasn't giving up on. It was you. It was me. He wasn't giving up on us. So you don't give up on you. Don't give up. Work it out. Work it out. Let's pray.